Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Blogatas. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible 2 series, we go through the word together, chapter and verse. And we are in the book of Ezekiel, and uh, we're making our way through these uh, last chapters of the book of Ezekiel. And um, I don't have anything highlighted here, so I'll just take a minute and, and point out, you know, I um, you know, hadn't really gone into great detail about it before, but these last chapters of Ezekiel uh, have been widely debated in church history for a long time and people are you know people have tried to figure it out and there are some details that are uh, beyond our current knowledge you know and so um like we've said before when talking about uh books of prophecy a lot of times you know we just have to store god's word in our heart those portions of god's word that we don't understand fully in our heart and um you know this reminds me of of uh, what the Bible says about Mary um, and you know she she received this assignment from God to carry Jesus and she didn't fully understand it it's like how is this possible you know and um, we don't know I mean uh, the angel Gabriel gave her a an explanation um, but we don't know if she fully understood it you know in fact we can look at it and say well we don't maybe we don't fully understand it right now but she just said, I'm the Lord's servant, may it be unto me as you said. You know, and when after Jesus was born, there was all these uh, prophesy, uh, prophecies about him that were taking place around her. Uh, and, um, and it says that she just kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. You know, so she wasn't trying to put her own interpretation on things. She wasn't trying to explain them. She was just storing them in her heart and trusting God, basically. And so, uh, you know, we can learn a lot from that, and especially about, about things like this. And, you know, was, as we read this, you know, there's measurement after measurement after, after measurement. And again, the significance of the, measure, the measuring is about what God is going to restore or what God is going to grant, you know. Um, and so sometimes he's measuring to restore and sometimes he's measuring to grant. As, a, as in for the first time. And so, um, again, you know, this physical temple that uh, Ezekiel is, this vision uh, that, that Ezekiel is given and this temple that is measured out before him, uh, this physical temple was never built. And um, will it be built? I don't know. Again, there's all these, all, a lot of speculation about this. Well, will this be built? Uh, will it be built during the millennial reign? Will it, you know, when will it be built? And the millennial reign is that thousand year period after Jesus returns and he reigns here on earth for a thousand years. And during that time, Satan is bound and then he's released for a short time after that. And uh, it may seem like, well, how would that even, how is that even possible? You know, and now, now one, one thing to, to point out here is that because we may look at this from in our perspective, our current perspective and our current time and place and the way that we view the world and our experiences that we have of, of the world as it is, we can look at that and say, that doesn't make much sense. In the mind of God, apparently it makes perfect sense. And so uh, just the same as people in the previous, uh, you know, in the old covenant, this new covenant now which we live where, where we have grace through Jesus wouldn't make any sense to them. They wouldn't be able to make sense of that. That's why when Jesus was explaining to uh, uh, um, to, to Nicodemus, uh, he's like, you, you, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, we, we know that old, he said, the, the, because of the things that you do, the miracles that you do, we know God is with you, you know, and um, Jesus said, no one can see God except the Son, you know, so, the, you know, the Son of God. So he's talking about, but he said, you, 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 have, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, how, what are you talking about? That, you know, it, do, it did not make any sense to his natural mind. And now, um, so in, in that same way, we can look at the next age and say, that doesn't make any sense to us. And uh, it doesn't have to make sense to us for it to make sense to God. And so that's really all I, you know, kind of wanted to, to lay out there before we begin to read this. And so let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you that all of your word is, is useful for instruction, correction, and reproof. Uh, I ask, Lord God, that you would give us uh, wisdom to, uh, to properly store this in our heart, 
to be able to understand the meaning and the process of time as you desire to reveal it to us. And I thank you for these things, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so here we go. Chapter 42 of Ezekiel. Then the man led me out of the temple courtyard by way of the north gateway. We entered the outer courtyard and came to a group of rooms against the north wall of the inner courtyard. This structure, whose entrance opened toward the north, was 175 feet long and 87 and a half feet wide. One block of rooms overlooked the 35-foot width of the inner courtyard. Another block of rooms looked out in, onto the pavement of the outer courtyard. The two blocks were built three levels high and stood across from each other. Between the two blocks of rooms ran a walkway 17 and a half feet wide. It extended the entire 175 feet of the complex, and all the doors faced north. Each of the two upper levels of rooms was narrower than the one beneath it because the upper levels had to allow space for walkways in front of them. Since there were three levels and they did not have supporting columns as in the courtyards, each of the upper levels was set back from the level beneath it. There was an outer wall that separated the rooms from the outer courtyard. It was 87 and a half feet long. This wall added length to the outer block of rooms, which extended for only 87 and a half feet. While the inner block, the rooms toward the temple extended for 175 feet. There was an eastern entrance from the outer courtyard to these rooms. On the south side of the temple, there were two blocks of rooms just south of the inner courtyard between the temple and the outer courtyard. These rooms were arranged just like the rooms of the north. There was a walkway between the two blocks of rooms just like the complex on the north side of the temple. This complex of rooms was the same length and width as the other one, and it had the same entrances and doors. The dimensions of each were identical, so there was an entrance in the wall facing the doors of the inner block of rooms and another on the east at the end of the interior walkway. Then the man told me these rooms that overlook the temple from the north and south are holy. Here the priests who offer sacrifices to the Lord will eat the most holy offerings. And because these rooms are holy, they will be used to store the sacred offerings, the grain offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. When the priests leave the sanctuary, they must not go directly to the outer courtyard. They must first take off the clothes they wore while ministering, because these clothes are holy. They must put on other clothes before entering the parts of the building complex open to the public. When the man had finished measuring the inside of the temple area, he led me out through the east gateway to measure the entire perimeter. He measured the east side with its measuring rod, and he gave eight, and it was, uh, excuse me, and it was 875 feet long. Then he measured the north side, and it was also 875 feet. The south side was also 875 feet, and the west side was also 875 feet. So the area was 875 feet on each side, with a wall all around it to separate what was holy from what was common. And you know, so some some uh, people who have speculated on this, and really, there's tons of theories out there about the meaning of this temple and you know why it was never built or or how it should you know will eventually be built and when it will be used and where it will be and and, <laughs> and all these things and you know one of the theories was that it's you know it, it symbolizes that that heavenly jerusalem that the bible describes in the book of revelation is coming down out of heaven and then uh, uh resting on the earth okay and uh, that's portrayed in the, the the book of Revelation like a cube. Well, now again, that is a uh, a book of symbols, and so will the would the city actually look like that? Probably not. It's it's a, it, the way that it appears in the vision symbolizes some spiritual truth, um, you know. But then the book of Revelation also says that there's no temple in there because God Himself will be the temple, and so then you could also uh, speculate then that. Um, if that is what this symbolizes, then the temple, that temple itself will represent, uh, you know, God himself, you know, and then the proportions within it then would um, speak to attributes of, of his character. And so um, maybe, maybe not. I don't really know. But, uh, you know, the best thing to do is to simply be aware that it is here, that, that God has, has discussed it and that it will become relevant in its proper time then. And that we will have knowledge of it when we need to. So verse 43, after this, the man brought me back around to the east gateway. Suddenly, the glory of the Lord of God, uh, excuse me, the glory of the God of Israel appeared from the east. The sound of his coming was like the roar of rushing waters and the whole landscape shone with his glory. This vision was just like the others I had seen first by the Kabar River. And then when he came to destroy Jerusalem, and we've read about that, I fell face down on the ground. 
and the glory of the Lord came into the temple through the east gateway. Again, an example of uh, the physical body not able to, e even in a vision, not, not able to uh, withstand or, or say um, handle, you know, probably a better way to put it, handle God's, you know, the direct manifestation of his glory or his presence. It's just the physical body can't take it and falls down. And so then this would um, possibly then constitute a, uh, an open vision where it's a, it's a spiritual happening that Ezekiel is physically standing within. And so then he is physically affected by the things that he sees, just like John was in the book of Revelation. So then, um, verse 5, Then the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner courtyard, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And I heard someone speaking to me from within the temple, while the man who had been measuring stood beside me. The Lord said to me, so he realizes oh, the one who's speaking to me from the temple, that's, that's God. So now he's, he's just filling in the blank here in his mind. The Lord said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place where I will rest my feet. I will live here forever among the people of Israel. They and their kings will not defile my holy name any longer by their uh, adulterous worship of other gods or by honoring the relics of their kings who have died. They put their idol altars right next to mine with only a wall between them and me. They defiled my holy name by such detestable sin, so I consumed them in my anger. Now let them stop worshiping other gods and honoring the relics of their kings, and I will live among them forever. So just a point of, you know, just a, a note here, you know, or something, a point that God makes is that God himself, is, he, he is literally saying that under the old covenant, when he was there, when, when his presence filled the, the first temple, that's the one that was destroyed that uh, in Ezekiel's time, God, you know, he dwelt among his people. His presence was right there in, in the temple. And he is saying that when they put idols just on the outside of the Holy of Holies, he's like, this is a wall separating my presence from these altars that they have set up. And so, you know, God's very upset. So then, uh, verse 10, Son of man, describe to the people of Israel the temple I have shown you, so they will be ashamed of all their sins. Let them study its plan, and they will be ashamed of what they have done. Describe to them all the specifications of the temple, including its entrances and exits and everything else about it. Tell them about its decrees and laws. Write down all these specifications and decrees as they watch, so they will be sure to remember and follow them. And this is the basic law of the temple about, uh, uh, wait, excuse me. And this is, the, this is the basic law of the temple, absolute holiness. The entire top of the mountain where the temple is built is holy. Yes, this is the basic law of the temple. So, and then he continues in verse 13. These are the measurements of the altar. There is a gutter all around the altar, 21 inches deep and 21 inches wide, with a curb 9 inches wide around its, its, its edge. And this is the height of the altar. From the gutter, the altar rises 3.5 feet to a lower ledge that surrounds the altar and is 21 inches wide. From the lower ledge, the altar rises 7 feet to the upper ledge that is also 21 inches wide. The top of the altar, the hearth, rises another 7 feet higher, with a horn rising up from each of the four, the four corners. The top of the altar is square measuring 21 feet by 21 feet. The upper ledge also forms a square, measuring 24 and a half feet by 24 and a half feet, with a 21-inch gutter and a 10 and a half inch curb all around the edge. There are steps going up the east side of the altar. Then he said to me, Son of man, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. These will be the regulations for the burning of offerings and the sprinkling of blood when the altar is built. At that time, the Levitical priests of the family of Zadok, who minister before me, are to be given a young bull for a sin offering, says the Sovereign Lord. You will take some of its blood and smear it on the four horns of the altar, the four corners of the upper ledge, and the curb that runs along that ledge. This will cleanse and make atonement for the altar. Then take the young bull for the sin offering and burn it up at the appointed place outside the temple area. On the second day, the sacrifice, sacrifice as a sin offering a young male goat that has no physical defects. Then cleanse and make atonement for the altar again, just as you did with the young bull. When you have finished the cleansing ceremony, offer another young bull that has no defects as a, permanent, a perfect ram from the flock. You are to present them to the Lord, and the priests are to sprinkle salt on them and offer them as a burnt offering to the Lord. Every day for seven days, a male goat, a young bull, and a ram for the flock will, from the flock excuse me, will be sacrificed as a sin offering. None of these animals may have physical defects of any kind. 
Do this each day for seven days to cleanse and make atonement for the altar, thus setting it apart for holy use. On the, se on the eighth day, and on each day afterward, the priests will sacrifice on the altar the burnt offerings and peace offerings of the people. Then I will accept you. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. So there's some similarities here <clears throat> that we see. So there's this <clears throat> uh, process of consecration or setting apart of, of holy use of these things. And we saw the same thing when uh, God ordained that first priesthood. And uh, you had that, that like, you know, opening time of setting apart <clears throat> before there was regular use established. And we see the same thing here. Now, what's interesting about this is that God, you know, is, you know, it, at some point when he's talking about this, I can't remember exactly where he said it, but he talks about, you know, give these measurements to the people when they have shown sorrow for what they have done, you know. And so one thing about this temple and the possible uh, building of it, some people say that, you know, they believe that this whole thing is just allegorical and this this was supposed to simply put the people in mind of how things should have actually been you know and some people say well this temple just represents you know like the first temple represents uh mankind <clears throat> and how mankind can meet with god the second temple there this temple then the ezekiel temple would represent um what it will be like when we have our restored or our, our glorious bodies like jesus has uh, when he returns and, and we have that so possibly maybe you know, maybe uh, in varying degrees, you know, different uh, amounts of this is, is possible, you know, because we do have that, uh, you know, possibility of, of uh, God fulfilling more than one thing by what he is saying here, you know. Um, and so it probably was meant to put the people in mind. In fact, God specifically said this was this is meant to put people, the people in mind of the shameful things that they have done and how it should be. You know, um, and so that being said, you know, some things are conditional. You know, God puts forth what he wants. And now in the end, he works all things together for the good of those who are called, who, who love him and are called according to his purposes. So in the end, uh, he will bring things about as he desires. But uh, there are also things that he has put forth that are conditional. And so like he told, the, he, you know, in the Old Testament, under the Old system of sacrifice and everything uh he wanted he made it clear he wanted the entire nation to be a kingdom of priests but yet there was only one tribe or, or only one family in one tribe that served him as priests in the old covenant and so um you know this could be then well you know this this family of zadok they were the only ones who through all of the idol worship stayed true to to god and so he's saying now okay because they were faithful they'll serve in this in this temple and so you could say well in a symbolic sense then um he wants us all to be like that family of zadok that are faithful to him no matter what goes on around us you know and so you you could look at it that way that that um that certainly is is true he wants us us to be faithful um does it apply the way that people have put it you know have have theorized with this temple possibly um what, how am I on time? Okay, I've got a few minutes left. So I'm wondering if we should continue that next chapter. Um, but, you know, that idea of things being conditional. So again, God wanted the entire nation to be priests. But uh, conditionally, that did not happen because uh, he could not do that under the conditions which the people themselves caused because of their unfaithfulness with the calf. The golden calf at the, the bottom of mount sinai and so we see there god had that plan so you could say that uh you know were the people truly repentant when they came back from babylon to to lay the foundation for the the second temple and then and then build it is it possible that god wanted this to be the temple that they built then possibly this this temple could be could be physically built but it would be an enormous undertaking but it could it could be built so was that temple the one that was supposed to be built then possibly um you know uh d d because it's possible that their heart condition didn't meet the con the the uh the requirements that god put for them to be given the full dimensions of this of this temple for them to be able to do that um or maybe they just didn't do it you know it wouldn't be the first time that the people 
disobeyed God's command. <laughs> in fact, that's the whole reason that they were in Babylon to begin with. You know, um, that doesn't make us perfect looking back from, from our vantage point. But, uh, you know, it's just an interesting, an interesting thought. I think I will go ahead and move on to the next chapter um, just because um, it just seems like the right thing to do at this point. So uh, in chapter 44, I have verse 22 highlighted out. And that's just um, deals with some husband and wife things that you might want to explain to your little listening ears later on or how, whenever you, you want to do that. So in, in chapter 44, it says, And the man brought me back to the east gateway in the outer wall of the temple area, but it was closed. And the Lord said to me, This gate must remain closed. It will never again be opened. No one will ever open it and pass through, for the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered here. Therefore, it must always remain shut. Only the prince himself may sit inside this gateway to feast in the Lord's presence, but he may come and go only through the entry room of the gateway. And the man brought me through the north gateway to the front of the temple. I looked and saw that the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord, and I fell face down on the ground. <laughs> so he falls down again. And the Lord said to me, Son of man, take careful notice. Use your eyes and ears and listen to everything I tell you about the regulations concerning the Lord's temple. Take careful note of the procedures for using the temple's entrances and exits, and give these rebels, the people of Israel, this message from the Sovereign Lord. O people of Israel, enough of your detestable sins. You have brought uncircumcised foreigners into my sanctuary, people who have no heart for God. So again, the holy, the, the heart of the temple, the holy of holies of the temple represents the heart. And so God takes this very seriously. Uh, so in the middle of uh, that bottom part of, of verse 7, In this way you defiled my temple, even as you offered me my food, the fat and blood of sacrifices. In addition to all your other detestable sins, you have broken my covenant. Instead of safeguarding my sacred rituals, you have hired foreigners to take charge of my sanctuary. So this is what the, the Sovereign Lord says. No foreigners, including those who live among the people of Israel, will ever enter my sanctuary if they have not been circumcised and have not surrendered themselves to the Lord. So then uh, the New Testament uh, of note should, I mean, I should note, uh, talks about the circumcision of the heart, you know, uh, but we won't go in, you know, deeply into that. We've discussed that before. So verse 10, And the men of the tribe of Levi who abandoned me when Israel strayed away from me to worship idols must bear the consequences of their unfaithfulness. They may still be uh, temple guards and gatekeepers, and they may slaughter the animals brought for burnt offerings and be present to help the people. But they encouraged my people to worship idols, causing Israel to fall into deep sin. So I have taken a solemn oath that they must bear the consequences for their sins, says the Sovereign Lord. They may not approach me to minister as priests. They may not touch any of my holy things or the holy offerings, for they must bear the shame of all the detestable sins they have committed. They are to serve as the temple caretakers, taking charge of the maintenance work and performing general duties. However, the Levitical priests of the family of Zadok continued to minister faithfully in the temple when Israel abandoned me for idols. These men will serve as my ministers. They will stand in my presence and offer the fat and blood of the sacrifices, says the Sovereign Lord. They alone will enter my sanctuary and approach my table to serve me. They will fulfill all my requirements. When they enter the gateway to the inner courtyard, they must wear only linen clothing. They must wear no wool while on duty in the inner courtyard or in the temple itself. They must wear linen turbans and linen undergarments. They must not wear anything that would cause them to perspire. When they return to the outer courtyard where the people are, they must take off the clothes they wear while ministering to me. They must leave them in the sacred rooms and put on other clothes so they do not endanger anyone by transmitting holiness to them through this clothing. So uh, that would make them accountable. So that's that's the significance of that. It's like, you know, uh, God expects his people to be holy, but there is a uh, there's a distinction made here uh, that's, you know, that's of note. So verse 20, they must neither shave their heads nor let their hair grow too long. Instead, they must trim it regularly. The priests must not drink wine before entering the inner courtyard. Verse 23, they will teach my people the difference between what is holy and what is common, what is ceremonially clean and unclean. And he means by visual example. That's, um, I mean, also through, through, you know, through instruction, but also through this visible, visible example of how they are to, um, to conduct themselves while ministering as priests. Verse 24, they will serve as judges to resolve any disagreements among my people. Their decisions must be based on my regulations. 
and the priests themselves must obey my instructions and decrees at all the sacred festivals, and see to it that the Sabbaths are set apart as holy days. A priest must not defile himself by being in the presence of a dead person, unless it is his father, mother, child, brother, or unmarried sister. In such cases it is permitted. Even then he can return to his temple duties, only after being ceremonially cleansed, and then waiting for seven days. The first day he returns to work and enters the inner courtyard and the sanctuary. He must offer a sin offering for himself, says the Sovereign Lord. The priest will not have any property or possession of land, for I alone am their special possession. Their food will come from the gifts and sacrifices brought to the temple by the people, the grain offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings. Whatever anyone sets apart for the Lord will belong to the priests. The first of the ripe fruits and all the gifts brought to the Lord will go to the priests. The first batch of dough must also be given to the priests, so the Lord will bless your homes. The priests may not eat meat from any bird or animal that dies a natural death or that dies after being attacked by another animal. And so then, you know, you know, just this parting thought, um, you know, people, you know, people have put forth different theories about this temple. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think, well, it's probably going to uh, be built during the millennial reign of Jesus, that thousand years. To me, that theory seems unlikely, seeing as how Jesus fulfilled the need for all of this. And so um, it's quite possible that God did expect them to build this temple. Or, but again, the condition was that their heart had to be right in order for this temple to be built when they came back from Babylon. The other possibility, and I think is interesting, is something that I didn't see, uh, I haven't seen in, in other theories that people talk about, is that this temple is the temple that they will uh, build in modern day Jerusalem, um, you know, the, or that they will seek to build in this, and, and um, you know, then that temple would subsequently be uh, defiled, you know, by the Antichrist, possibly. Um, don't really know, but uh, again, you know, it's all it's all speculation. It's it's really again that we can classify this as something that's interesting for us to know, um, and in due time, the significance of it will be revealed, uh, because that's you know that's what God will will do. He says, then you know, in that day we'll know as we're known. We'll we'll know all these things. We'll have understanding. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this you know, this goodness. I thank you that, at the very least, this is a reminder to us that some things that you talk to us about are conditional and that we need to endeavor to keep our heart right before you. It's possible to do that, to, to uh, keep our heart um, yielded to the things that please you. And in that way, we will have a heart after your heart. And I thank you for these things. I ask your blessing upon everyone who turns, tunes in here. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.